Did you know? Goldeneye was originally going to be a 2D side-scroller for the Super Nintendo. Rare had recently made Donkey Kong Country and felt that the easiest way to make Goldeneye a hit would be to make it similar to DKC. This idea was quickly pushed aside in favor of an on-rail shooter, like Sega's Virtua Cop, only for Nintendo's upcoming 64-bit console. A team of about 10 individuals were assembled to work on Goldeneye. Eight of these team members had never worked on a game before, but their inexperience proved to be an invaluable asset. Since they'd never developed a game, they weren't held back by the traditional game development standards and mentalities. The initial development process centered around creating this on-rails shooter. Features such as reloading your gun, penalties for killing innocents and civilians, and pressing the R trigger for a closer aim were added thanks to similar mechanics appearing in Virtua Cop. The team made an on-rails version of the gas plant level, but began to experiment with letting the player move around freely. As it turned out, the ability to move around the level instead of being stuck on a single track made the gameplay much better. The first year of GoldenEye's development was spent simply making a game engine and the basic assets needed to test it. The priority for the designers was to create interesting levels. Adding characters and objectives to the levels didn't come until later. The team made a list of gadgets from the Bond films, then modeled them, then later tried to find levels where they could be used. GoldenEye developer Martin Hollis said, The benefit of this sloppy, unplanned approach was that many of the levels in the game have a real realistic and non-linear feel. This realism was partly due to some of the rooms in the game serving little to no purpose, just as some of the rooms in a real building would be empty or unimportant. The process of putting levels together with missions and objectives was inspired by Super Mario 64. The difference was that GoldenEye's objectives were strung together to be completed in a single playthrough, rather than having to restart the level after completing each objective. A lot of GoldenEye's development actually happened before Rare even had a Nintendo 64 development kit. The engine initially ran on an SGI Onyx workstation, and the game was tested with a modified Sega Saturn controller. Once they had the proper dev kit and controller, the developers had the idea of reloading weapons by having the player unplug and reinsert the N64 rumble pack. This would have mirrored the action of reloading a magazine into a gun, but the idea was shot down by Nintendo. The level intros where the camera moves into Bond's head to show his line of sight, and Bond's arm coming up on screen to check his watch were both implemented to immerse the player and make them feel more like the real James Bond. Surprisingly, the multiplayer in GoldenEye was an afterthought and was put together during the last six weeks of the game's development. The higher-ups at Rare had no idea that the mode was in the game until the team presented it to them. The developers hadn't asked permission from Rare or Nintendo to implement the multiplayer mode, but simply went ahead with it anyway. What's even more surprising is that the game was almost never released. There was a three-month period where Nintendo simply stopped funding the project. Nintendo felt that the game had too many bugs and didn't believe it would work out. Despite this, Rare had faith in the game and kept paying the team to work on it. GoldenEye was finally released in 1997 after two and a half years of development. A racing version of the game was also in development for the Virtual Boy, but was cancelled before release. Three of the lead actors from previous James Bond movies were originally going to be playable in GoldenEye. Sean Connery, Roger Moore, and Timothy Dalton could all be used in multiplayer, but had to be cut from the game for legal reasons. This is likely due to the fact that the character models were representing real-world individuals, and Rare didn't have permission to use their likenesses. The characters can be seen on page 20 of the game's instruction booklet, and traces of them can still be found in the game. Using GameShark codes, their portraits can be put back into the game character select menu in multiplayer. Their portrait will replace Pierce Brosnan's, but Brosnan's character model will remain. There's also code in the game suggesting that the alternate bonds were playable in the game's Aztec and Egypt bonus missions. Screenshots from the beta of the game show that the portraits were going to be used to represent the individual save slots. In the final game, however, they're all Brosnan. Although the bonds never made it into GoldenEye, they were referenced in GoldenEye's spiritual successor, Perfect Dark. The tuxedos for all four bonds can be accessed in the game's multiplayer mode. Another one of GoldenEye's hidden secrets is a functioning ZX Spectrum emulator. Users of the Rare Witch Project forums uncovered the emulator in GoldenEye's code in March of 2012. The emulator was an experiment by developer Steve Ellis to see if the Nintendo 64 was capable of emulating ZX Spectrum games and was meant to be removed from the game's code. Instead, the code was simply made inaccessible during normal play and was rendered inoperable. A patch was made so the emulator could be triggered from GoldenEye 
Size Folder Select screen. Several games were bundled with the emulator, which were all made by Rare in the 1980s when they went by the name Ultimate Play the Game. GoldenEye also has several unused multiplayer levels. The Statue Park and Cradle levels seen in the game's single-player campaign were planned to be used in the game's multiplayer mode as well. Using a GameShark code to access the single-player levels in multiplayer mode reveals the Statue and Cradle levels have proper item locations and multiplayer starting points where other single-player levels do not. The Cradle in particular had a slower frame rate than the other levels in single-player mode, and the additional strain of multiplayer would bring the frame rate down even more. This is possibly the reason why these levels were left out of multiplayer, as lag would have made it near impossible to play competitively. It's also thought that the statue level was cut because its dark atmosphere and large open design wasn't a good fit for multiplayer. Some text in the game's code also suggested that there was an unused level called Citadel. The level was eventually found in an incredibly unpolished state and seemed to be built around entirely different specifications than any other multiplayer level. Accessing the Citadel with a set of game shark codes will show the final programming for the game is barely even compatible with the level. The player can't walk up ramps, but they can walk through walls. The Citadel being in a different format than the other levels cemented the idea that it was only ever intended for testing purposes and that it was cast aside early on in development. Well, that's all for today, but don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Also, make sure you check out DidYouKnowGaming.com, where we post gaming trivia every single day. If you liked this video, then you should check out some of our other videos, too. And if you'd like to hear some more of my voice, you should check out my video for my top five time-consuming games. It's right there. All you have to do is click on it.